If you can't beat them, arrest them. The most overt way that our society attempts to discourage marijuana use is by the strict enforcement of prohibition. The personal possession of even small amounts of marijuana for non-medical purposes is currently illegal in all 50 states except Alaska, with penalties ranging widely from the imposition of small fines to extensive jail time. However, the mere fact that pot possession is illegal under the law does not tell the complete story. Just because an activity is defined as a crime does not necessarily mean the police will aggressively target and prosecute offenders. For example, in many states adultery is illegal, but you don't see cops staking out no-tell motels looking to crack down on adults who engage in a little extramarital fun on the side. The police don't get to choose which laws exist, but they and the local officials and police chiefs that guide them have an incredible amount of latitude to determine which ones they will enforce vigorously. And they have decided that they love arresting marijuana users. From the time Nixon officially launched the federal war on drugs to today, law enforcement agencies have busted nearly 20 million Americans for pot-related offenses, mostly for simple possession. And in recent years, the annual number of arrests have been rising. According to the FBI's Uniform Crime Reports, in 1994, police made 402,717 marijuana possession arrests. Just three years later, in 1997, they made over 600,000 pot possession arrests. But even that annual total wasn't enough. From the years 2000 to 2003, police averaged 641,000 marijuana possession arrests per year. From 2004 to 2007, the average was a whopping 723,612 arrests. Yet, you will rarely, if ever, hear America's top cops or politicians bragging about law enforcement's propensity for busting pot smokers. For instance, George W. Bush's drug czar John Walters, speaking at a press conference in 2008, proclaimed that nobody goes to jail for marijuana possession. Finding somebody in jail or prison for first-time nonviolent offender for possession of marijuana is like finding a unicorn, Walters said. It doesn't exist. First of all, this assertion simply isn't true. In fact, the Marijuana Policy Project disproved Walters' allegation with a quick Google search. But let's give the former drug czar the benefit of the doubt. Let's acknowledge that many people arrested for marijuana possession are not ultimately sentenced to serve time in prison. Does that mean these offenders get off scot-free? Hardly. For starters, even in states where marijuana possession is decriminalized, meaning there is generally no risk of jail time associated with the offense, those caught with a small amount of pot must still pay fines, appear in court, and may still receive a lifelong criminal record. In most other states, first-time offenders receive probation and must undergo months of mandatory drug testing. If they fail any of these court-mandated drug tests, as many eventually do, they will be sentenced to prison. In addition, with the growing popularity of drug courts, marijuana defendants, especially young people, face the very real threat of being forced to attend so-called drug treatment programs. As we noted in Chapter 5, up to 70% of Americans enrolled in state drug treatment programs for cannabis have been placed there by the courts. Are these people struggling with an addiction to pot? No, not at all. In fact, many of these individuals had not even used marijuana in the month prior to their admission, a strong indication that they did not have a serious addiction to the substance. Of course, beyond the very real risk of fines, probation, and court-ordered drug treatment, a marijuana arrest and conviction, even if it does not result in jail time, can produce additional collateral damage. Individuals unfortunate enough to experience pot-related run-ins with the law enforcement also face, depending on where they live, the likelihood of losing their driver's license, even if the offense did not involve the operation of a motor vehicle, their jobs, their kids, their home, particularly if they reside in publicly subsidized housing, their student financial aid, their right to vote, their ability to adopt children, and even their food stamps. 
believe it or not, virtually no other criminal offenses, including violent crimes like rape or murder, trigger this same plethora of sanctions. Even an armed bank robber remains eligible for federal financial aid following his conviction. And while it does not appear, at least on the surface, that the aggressive enforcement of marijuana laws has significantly lowered cannabis use rates in the United States, one can be certain that the threat of legal repercussions has influenced more than a few Americans, older Americans especially, to forego pot and choose booze instead. Citing his own personal history with marijuana and alcohol, St. Louis Post-Dispatch opinion columnist Bill McClellan emphasized this point in a 2009 column writing, I consider pot no more harmful than booze, maybe less harmful. Of course, in a perfect world, we wouldn't need any intoxicants. We'd all be high on life, digging sunsets, but few of us have found that kind of inner peace, and so we seek something less natural than a sunset. For most of us, it's a drink to take the edge off the day. For others, it's a joint. The odd thing is one legal and one isn't. I say odd because I have enjoyed many a drink and many a joint, and I don't feel any better about myself because I no longer smoke pot. I no longer smoke pot only because I don't want to get in trouble. In that regard, I'm no different than most of my contemporaries.